Well, good morning, church. Welcome to James Island. Happy Mother's Day to all the mothers out there. If you will stand as you're making your way in, um, you can grab your communion elements as well. Um, we're going to begin with just a couple of courses and sing this out. So if you will sing with us. Oh, hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost his grip on me. You have broken every chain. The salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my name. Happy Mother's Day. Oh, sorry. You need to see me. All right. Good morning, church. Let's read from 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. Let's pray. Lord, we just rejoice in you. We thank you that you are a living hope. Lord, we just thank you that you're here present with us, and we pray this morning we would rejoice. Lord, we would feel your spirit moving. God, we had freedom to worship. We just thank you for all that you do, Lord. Bless this service in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So good morning again. My name is Isaac. I'm one of the home group leaders here. And just something about being connected in the church. Home groups are a great way. You meet weekly, you get connected. So if you have any questions about home groups, you can go to our website. Or in, in the lobby out here, you can get more information. So home groups, get plugged in. It's a blessing. It's been a blessing for our group. Connect cards. If you're new here, we just want to give you a special welcome if you've been coming for a couple of weeks and you want to get connected, have prayer requests, you can write the connect, on the Connect card any prayer requests, who you are, we can follow up with you. Those are located on the, in the pockets in the back of the chairs, and then you can drop them in the back, in the black boxes when you, on your way out. Also, if you're a member, you've been coming to church a while, it's a great way for prayer needs that you have, or song requests. So you're missing a song that we used to play, write that on there. Seriously, it's a great opportunity. Careful. But, Careful. Careful. <laughs> but this is a good opportunity for you also that the elders, the church, we can be praying for you. Um, we don't want you to leave here and you have a need that you didn't come up and get prayed for. So that's an opportunity for the church members. I just have a couple announcements. The first big one, VBS. Vacation Bible School. Yes, we have over 60 kids it's coming. Yes, I'm looking for a little bit more excitement this morning because it's Mother's Day. Did you get enough coffee this morning? Did your husband, your kids give it to you? I mean, what, what happened? I want excitement. VBS is happening. But, but we need, we need more volunteers. So 18 and over, we, need, we only have seven signed up right now. In order for this to be a successful event, we need you. So if you're in college, you're looking for something to do this summer, if you're a grandparent, if you're retired, this is a great opportunity to serve our kids. There's more information in your bulletin. Get signed up. Um, we're looking forward to it. Also, kids, 
We're looking for more kids to be a part of that. So it'll be a blessing. Also, we need volunteers for Rockfest, uh, specifically prayer volunteers. It's on May 14th. There's a QR code in your bulletin. You can just take your smartphone out, take a picture, of, or just scan, your, scan it, and it'll take you to the website. Um, this will be a, a great opportunity, music, uh, preaching the gospel, a blessing for everyone attending. So do that. We need more volunteers. And next, I'm going to ask, ask for a, a Three Rivers foster update. We're going to have Heather and Tana come up, and they'll give you a little bit more information. I have to, there they come. All right, give them a hand. This is a great help. Morning. Um, I have the great pleasure to introduce my beautiful friend here, Tana Dukes. She is the supervisor over the foster care team at Lifeline Children's Services. So, Tana. <laughs> Thank y'all for having me this morning. So May is Foster Care Awareness Month in the state of South Carolina, if y'all don't know. Um, I know many people, including the alts, are foster parents and they know what this is like, but if you need like a little brief thing about foster care, so there's about 400,000 kids in foster care in the country. Um, there's about 4,000 in the state of South Carolina alone. And in the Tri-County area, which is Charleston, Ber you know, Berkeley County, Dorchester County, there's always a deficit of about 200, 200 kids that need somewhere to go. Um, and so for the last three years, I've had the privilege of working for a ministry, Lifeline Children's Services, where um, we believe the church is the answer to that, right? We believe that if we have all these evangelical churches and we have all these great people out there who love their families well and they steward their communities well, they can do that with kids in foster care. Um, and so, for May, I just want to highlight that and um, bring that to the forefront because one of the biggest needs right now is teens. Um, we have kids that are 14, 15, 16, and 17 who constantly don't have a home. Um, so in my role at Foster in, at Lifeline, we're constantly getting calls. They're like, do y'all have a home? And we have, on average, about 25 to 35 um, foster homes at any given time. Um, and we never have anything. You know, um, so think about your kids. You, you know, I know... Everyone in the room probably has different various ages. Everyone just assumes two and three year olds are easier, right? One year olds are easier. Are they easier? I, I don't think they're easier. <laughs> they're harder to beat. Um, but it's a, it's a very unique opportunity to really come into the life of a child who maybe had a lot of trauma or maybe had a lot of things going on in their lives when they were four and five, but that's just continued, right? And then now they're 15 and 16 and 17 and they need a model and they need someone to love them and to care for them. And so um, what I wanted to do is because the alts have been foster parents for a long time, um, very faithful, joyful people, despite all the challenges of foster care, I wanted to ask them a couple questions about how do they know this is the time to foster? Right, because everybody's like, well, I go to churches all the time and talk about foster care. At the end of the service, there are no less than 20 people that come to me every single time. Oh, I always knew I wanted to foster. I always knew I wanted to adopt. So the Lord's calling his people to do this. There's a disconnect, right? And so what, what has you in that holding space? And I think that's what I'd love Heather to speak into. How do you know that it's that time? You know about foster care. You know about adoption. You know people in your community have done it. How do you know the Lord is calling you to do it right now? Um, for me, the calling started when I became a mom, and the Lord opened up my heart bigger than I thought. And he shared his heart with me for these kids. And it was heavy, and it was hard to sit in. And I said, God, tell me what to do. <laughs> Tell me what you want me to do, because I knew he had, me, he had me to do something. And so for me, that was the simple question of, what do you want me to do, God? And then it was, honestly, I needed to act in obedience, and I had to step out, despite the risk that I might have seen that it would involve. I think a big thing for me, a big barrier for me, is my comfort, my control, 
my structure already. So, because you know, when you bring a child in, things are going to change. And it might not be the same as it was at home before. And I had to be okay with that, knowing that if the Lord's calling me into it, he's going to provide everything that I need in order to take care of this child and also my family. Yeah. So that's great. So, so y'all's homework, right? So I, I want you to think through... What does this look like? What are the implications? Because at Lifeline, we don't believe everybody's called to foster or adopt. That's okay. But that means that you have a role somewhere, right? Like there are kids everywhere who, who need someone somewhere to be, but there's people like the alts who may, maybe you can make them dinner, you know? Maybe you can babysit. Or maybe you can just step into that somewhere else. But so the, the assignment is how, how do I pray? You know, go home and ask the Lord, if you're burdened for this issue, wh- where do I belong within it? And so I appreciate y'all for listening this morning, and, um, and thank you for your prayers. Um, I'd like to present one way, maybe, that you could um, step out. I think we might have a, a little image, but um, me and my hu- husband have um, founded Three Rivers Respite, which is a nonprofit camp for children in foster care. It will provide consistent camp opportunities for them free of charge and consistent um, respite care for the caregivers so they can get a break and recharge and be the best that they can for the kids. Um, May 21st, we are having a foster parents night out from 4 to 8. So the kids get to come and enjoy a camp experience and the caregivers get to go out and enjoy an evening to relax, maybe grab something to eat. Um, But we need volunteers for that, too. I feel like we're asking for a lot of volunteers. But if foster care specifically is on your heart, this is one way you can be involved. And as you continue to pray what the Lord has for you that, I know for me a big tipping point was meeting kids that are in the system, seeing their faces, putting a name to it, and seeing that it's right in our backyard. Um, So you can just, I don't have an image, I guess, but... You can just catch me afterwards if you're interested and or email me at heather at threeriversrespite.com. Yeah, I'll be in the lobby, maybe with all my kids around me. But <laughs> um, but yeah, and that I just want to thank you, Tana, again. And um, if I could just pray for us. so Lord, we just thank you. You are so good. And I pray this morning, God, that you would reveal your heart to us for for mothers, these mothers that are stuck in a cycle that can't mother the way that you created them to, God. I pray for these children that are not with their mothers. Their mothers are here and they're trying what they can do to be able to be reunified. But God, there's the cycle of sin that needs to be broken over this generation. And it starts with families that can step up and say, yes, God, I will take the call. I will be your hands and feet. I will love these children with your heart. So God, can you just show us your heart for these families that are broken? Can you show us your heart for these kids? How do you want us to love them? How can we love them best, God? We pray that you would just break our heart for what breaks yours and that you would move us by your Holy Spirit in acts of obedience individually as you call us each individually for the plans and the purposes that you've set before us for our good and for your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, um, before we jump into worship, and we're so thankful for the alts and for Tana, who's new to our church. Uh, and all of you, there's quite a lot of families in the church that participate in adoption and foster care. So I don't think we had that link or it wasn't in your, uh, in your bulletin, but we'll make sure we send something out uh, today through text or email um, to let you know how to sign up for that um, Three Rivers event so you know how to help them. Um, we have some guests with us this morning that I wanted to just make you aware of. Um, and that is uh, Francis and Edith Armstrong who are right here. Francis is a pastor in Ontario, Canada. His son, uh, Serge, you guys have seen around, and Emmy are a part of our church uh, and are normally here, Um, but the Armstrongs are not normally with us because they're up leading a church uh, in Canada. And just as we were praying for them this morning, so I I wanted to introduce them at the beginning 
uh, so that all of our Canadians that are uh, scattered throughout to make sure that during the greeting time you go and, and meet them. Um, but also, just in the brief time of, of getting to hear from them, they've just they've gone through a really difficult last few years, and, uh, which has involved one of the things is just being a, giving a clear gospel proclamation in Canada has come with a lot of very overt persecution. I mean, people in their city trying to shut their church down. I mean, that, that um, specifically. And so we just want to honor you guys and just say thank you for um, what you're doing there. And we want uh, today to be a blessing to them. Um, and I think it will go right along with what the Lord is speaking to us through his word. But as we gather together in prayer, uh, Francis started by praying this verse in Lamentations. And so I want you guys to stand up. And I just wanted to read what he said, because I think um, having come from a place of... Um, where there's, uh, where there's a lot of hostility. I mean, we really live in, just live in a dark place. We live in a dark world, and we're called to be people of the light. And what allows us to be people like uh, Tana and Heather and, uh, and to step into places of darkness and to be the light is that we know the mercies of the Lord. That we're just people that are so aware of the goodness and faithfulness of our God. This is what Lamentations 3 says. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. And so church, we have an opportunity to sing and to declare the faithfulness of the Lord today. I loved even just hearing a glimpse of the band practicing. Um, you know, one of the things that Tim and Jackie are gonna lead us in this morning is just singing in a new song to the Lord. And there, this, the place was just filled with the sound of their two voices, just, just from an overflow of what God had, ha, has done in them, just singing out to the Lord. And so I wanna invite you to join with them in that as the band leads us. That, that for us as a people, it would just be like, it would be like a holy roar in here. I mean, it would be a declaration of all that God is because we are just so aware of his mercy. And so Lord, we just come to you as your people and we stand in the midst of a world that is dark and confused and hurting and where there are, as our sisters have just made us aware, there are children that are hurting that need rescue. And we just thank you, God, for the mercies, for your mercies, that they are new every morning. We stand in your mercies today, God. We don't stand because of our own faithfulness or our own righteousness. We don't bring to you today our good works. We stand in the mercies of the Lord, new today. We thank you for your faithfulness, God. We pray that as we sing about your wonders today, that we would behold you. We would see you for who you are. We would be amazed by you and that our only response would be worship that you are worthy of. Our only response would be lives of surrender to you. And so God, we give you this time. These songs are for you. We delight in you. We love you. We thank you for your faithfulness to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Let's sing together. Yeah. I want to read this quick passage from uh, 1 Corinthians, just talking about the Spirit and as a congregation just pressing in. Um, I've just been praying this week about expectancy. And so in 1 Corinthians, um, I won't read the whole thing, but it talks about uh, when we're obedient, the Spirit gives us gifts. And so how cool would this be? So it says... Uh, for to one is given the utterance of wisdom and to another the utterance of knowledge, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to, to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. And so how awesome would that be if our expectation on a Sunday morning, coming together as a congregation was each of us, and not that everyone would have the same one, but each of us as the body would be able to move in that and be faithful. Um, so just for 30, 60 seconds, let's just lift up our voice um, and just pray.
we do a really good job of worship when the words are on the screen. But as a church, I just want us to press in. Um, if you speak in tongues, start speaking in tongues. And just um, if at the in 30, 60 seconds, if it's just Jackie, Alan, and I, like, I'm okay with that. But um, just, just as a church, like Russ was saying, how awesome would it be to be to hear a mighty roar of an individual song as we sing out in unison? So, um, yeah, just take 30 seconds to a minute and um, just lift up a personal song, and then we'll we'll start singing. We'll worship together. Still is 
What a powerful name 
Jesus, we just say together that you have no rival and you have no equal. And we thank you that you have silenced the boasts of sin and grave. And Jesus, we thank you. We just say together as your people that your name is above every other name. You don't have an equal, God. You have no rival. You have no one that competes against your strength. No one who rallies against your wisdom. You are perfect and complete. You are all powerful. You are wise, you are true, you are beautiful. And so we just, we just again today as your people, we stand on the foundation of that truth. We anchor our lives in that truth, that your name is above every other name. Thank you, God. Just in light of that truth, we're going to remember just the covenant relationship we have with God and with each other through communion. Ralph's going to lead us. So if you would, grab your elements and then you can have a seat. Ralph's going to lead us through that time. Such a great opportunity to rejoice and to be a part of what our Lord has done for us. This is a very solemn, but a very, very celebratory time. A solemn time because we remember the death of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and a time of celebration because we are a part of that, and we look forward to Him coming again. So if you have your elements, if you would take the bread on the night that Jesus was betrayed, He took the bread and He blessed it. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this bread that represents your body that was offered on the tree. Father, we praise you. We exalt you. We glory in you. Jesus took that bread and he blessed it. Then he gave it to his disciples and he said, take eat. This is the body which is given for you. In that same time, he took the cup, so rich in meaning. He said this cup represents the shed blood of the new covenant. The shed blood, his blood, that would cover our sins. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Jesus died for us and shed his blood for us. Amen. Drink the wine. Paul said, for as oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. He's coming again. So let's give the Lord a big round of applause. Our Lord and Savior is coming again. Hallelujah. Thanks, Ralph. All right, well, um, just thinking of communion and being something that we do uh, in community together, we're going to stand up in just a moment and greet each other. But before we do, uh, I want to show you a quick video clip of something that we have coming up. Um, so the first weekend in June is, um, is Pentecost, and uh, we celebrate um, the, the outpouring of, of God's Spirit, and it's, it's just something that the, the church has done throughout history, and uh, really Pentecost, the, the, the time when um, the people of uh, Israel were gathered in Jerusalem, they were gathered to celebrate the Feast of Shavuot, which is a, a one of the 
one of the three pilgrimage feasts where they would come in and they were, um, they were glorying the harvest. They were also remembering that the law was given. And so we have this great dynamic of celebrating word and spirit, which we are as a church. Um, we hold those two things up, um, that we want to be people of the word, that we want to be people of his spirit. And so, and just kind of thinking through, hey, we want to, we want to do something that weekend um, to celebrate and then realize that it was the 35th anniversary of the church is just within a couple of days of that. Uh, but in the very first gathering of the church. And so in the process, uh, two of our international par partners, uh, Anasfor and Ali, have both agreed to come, which we didn't think was going to even be possible. And so it's ended up being a great weekend celebration. And so we're going to have uh, worship services on Friday night, um, on Saturday, and then on Saturday morning. And it's just going to be time in the Word, time in worship and prayer together. Uh, and we want you to be a part of it. So take a look at this video and get excited. Pray for the church. Bless this church, O oh Lord. Bless the elders. Bless the members. Bless every single family which is part of this bigger family. I pray that you will fill them up with your Holy Spirit. I pray that you will revive the hearts. You will revive everyone. I pray that the passion for your kingdom will continue to increase. Would you, Lord, use them? Would you use them through their conduct, which is transformed, and people will know who you are? Would you use them, Lord, as they bless people, as they bless the city, as they bless whoever is uh, encountering them? I pray against any division, any threat, any shame of the devil that wants to destabilize the church. I proclaim peace and joy and the unity in that church. And we celebrate you, Lord, as we expand the kingdom together. And we celebrate you when we'll be together in heaven after all this ministry. We thank you, Jesus. In your holy name I pray. Amen. I pray for the church. Yes, it's going to be great. Um, so, yeah. So did you do a few things? Um, we'll let you know how to sign up, especially we'll, we'll need uh, sign-ups for chakra. And you guys can bring the lights all the way up because I want to see everybody's face. Um, we will need you to sign up to, to let us know what nights you're coming so that we can have childcare available. The other thing is, if you hadn't already heard, we're recruiting childcare workers from other churches. So people who love Jesus, they're fully plugged into their church. We're not trying to get them to come to our church. Uh, we're just trying on times like this Friday night when their church is not gathered and we could, um, we could pay them to come and assist us. That just helps spread the load out a little bit um, because we have lots of children. And so if you have a friend that fits that category, would you spread the word to them? The information is in your bulletin. Um, so we want to pr make preparation for that. And we're going to be ending the weekend on Sunday all together, having lunch together outside. We're praying that we'll have, we'll have some baptisms out there um, and just in the whole courtyard out uh, area. And it's just going to be a great celebration. So go to mark your calendar. You really, really don't want to miss it. So I'm telling you, to hear from Ali and Anasfor, I mean, just five minutes of hearing from those men will be worth you coming out. Um, they are just, they have incredible testimonies and they always come, um, they, they love being, a, being able to come and give to the church. And so just being able to receive from them is going to be a great gift. So, um, would you stand up and why don't you greet one another?
All right, you guys, go ahead and have a seat. All right, you social bunch, okay. You love each other so much. We're just gonna have to just say pause, just say pause and we'll unpause at the end of the service. So you can just jump right back into that conversation. That's right, we just gave you a taster. Okay, Laura Lee is with us, one of our beautiful moms and grandmothers and she's gonna come. We're in John chapter 15 or chapter 16. You'd have been like, wait, what's going on? Uh, I gave hope it's 16. <laughs> She's going to read 16 because that's actually where we are because our moms keep us straight. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Go ahead. John 16, 16 through 22. A little while and you will see me no longer and again a little while and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, what is this that he says to us a little while and you will not see me and again a little while and you will see me and because I'm going to the Father... So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he's talking about. <laughs> Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, is this what you're asking yourselves? What I mean by saying a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me? Truly I say to you, you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. But when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for time together as the family of God. Thank you for this, this uh, promise you gave your disciples of everlasting joy. And I just thank you even just in hearing the buzz of people greeting today that we hear the sound of joy, the sound of people, people's faces showing that they love each other. And we just desire to behold you, Lord, today through your word. We want to see you clearly. We want to respond to you in surrender. Thank you that your word is living and active. It judges the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts. It reveals to us who we really are. And so we pray for wisdom and revelation and knowledge of you. We pray that for understanding more of ourselves in light of the, the days in which we live. And that we would be transformed today. We'd be made new to, by you. We pray that there will be people here today that are just asking questions or seeking would go from death to life, would choose to follow you with their lives. And so we just surrender this time to you, and we thank you for it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, happy Mother's Day again, again to our moms. I don't know if it was mentioned earlier, but we're going to pray for you at the end uh, of, right at the end of the message. In fact, that's why we did communion a little bit earlier. We're going to have a time of prayer for you, and we want to honor you. We don't normally have sermons like, around themes on things like Mother's Day, but it just so happened as we looked at this passage of Scripture that it, it fell perfectly on the day uh, today where the main metaphor is a metaphor about moms and a metaphor about birth. And so um, the Scriptures are very helpful in that regard to us today and give us a really clear picture of being very aware of the times in which we live um, and, and, and very uh, aware of suffering. And you guys have heard me say before that there, there's just something about this passage and um, the urgency with which Jesus was teaching and the truth in it that is so for us as the people of God today. But as we engage in that truth, I want us to just start by acknowledging the humanity of the disciples. Because if you didn't catch it when Laura Lee was reading, he's explaining to them. So Jesus is talking about the time that's going to happen between him dying and him resurrecting. So he's talking about this time when they're not going to see him anymore and they're going to be, in, you know, they're going to be worried. They're going to be fretful. They're going to wonder what's going on. He's, he's preparing them for that time. Like he's such a faithful shepherd, 
leader, caregiver. He's preparing them for what's to come in the future. He's preparing them for those three days where they're not going to see him. And, he's tr- and actually, one of the apologetics to, to the authenticity of this eyewitness account of John is that it's written the way it's written. Because it was written after, you know, after he had died and resurrected and ascended. So it's written after all these things had come about, and yet John still writes it as one who's trying to write a detailed account of what he actually saw and heard. And so he writes it in such a way where we get a little glimpse into the disciples' humanity because in verse 19 it says, they said Jesus knew, or sorry, verse 18. So they were saying, what does he mean by a little while? We don't know what he's talking about. (laughs) Isn't this great? Do anybody feel freed up? Like they're sitting there in front of Jesus and they're not, you know, they're not like, oh, we got everything. They're like, "Um, what did he mean by this? And okay, you, you guys, what is he talking about? You know, like they're like leaning to the, I, I don't, I'm not following. Now here, sort of the humanity of the disciples, clear and present in this. And then we have the shepherding care of Jesus. Verse 19, Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, and so he said to them. Jesus knew what they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, is this what you were asking yourselves, what I meant by saying, a little while you will not see me, and again, a little while you will see me? They're like, yes, Jesus, that's exactly what we were thinking in our minds. You know, an incredible grace we have today is that God knows us. Like, he doesn't have to get to know you. And if he doesn't have to get to know you, it means you don't have to put anything on. You don't have to put a face on. You don't have to try to act like you know everything that's going on. You don't have to act like you have it all together. He actually already knows exactly where you are. Which means every place of struggle... (laughs) every place of an honest and difficult question that you were asking, God already knows that. He already knows what you're asking. So he preempted the disciples in their moment of confusion of not knowing (laughs) what was going on and no one's asking, isn't this the question that you were asking? And he begins to explain further. And that's at the very heart of this passage. He makes some statements that are really important and I want them to frame our conversation this morning. He says, you will weep, The world will rejoice, your sorrow will turn to joy, and no one will take that joy from you. He says you will weep, verse 20, truly, truly, I say to you, you will weep and lament, you will be sorrowful. Verse 21, when a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come. So it's great when metaphors are not the kind of things where we have to like try, you know, like all the farming metaphors, like unless you've been a farmer, you're kind of like trying to understand because like these little like, you know, grow bags you have in the backyard. But but for all of us in our stories that a lot of us in one way or another, we understand whether we have not personally experienced it, but been around people that there's pain in childbirth. Um, I remember our first child, Noah, who's just turned 14, and uh, we were just we were just newbies. Like, you know, we didn't know what was going on. We had our whole birth plan. We had gone to like natural birth classes, which is like a whole experience in and of itself. And so we're just like, you know, we're coming in, we've got our plan, we've got it all written down. And we were, Jackie and I were laughing even on the way in. I told her that, I was talking to her about, you know, the message and just saying, you know, do you remember we even had, we had like essential oils and cotton balls, <laughs> like in Ziploc bags? <laughs> And so I remember the moment where we were watching a movie together. So what they didn't tell us in the birthing classes was that she, her labor didn't progress. And so they then had to give her Pitocin. So they had to give her uh, medicine to start the labor. And we didn't realize that that kind of, it kind of changes the birth plan a little bit. It changes the trajectory. So I had all the steps. I had like my husband things that I was going to do. And we're watching a movie. And I don't remember exactly what Jackie said, all uh, other than, I just remember she told me, turn the movie off. <laughs> and I just remember the environment in the room changed. That's all I, you know, at that time I wasn't saying, I felt like it was a, it was a time I had enough like people skills in the moment to be like, I probably shouldn't say anything. But in my mind, I was like, what step are we on? <laughs> um, do we, do you, is now the time, does she need to smell oils now? I don't know. <laughs> does this, is this what you want? I don't know. <laughs> Um, thankfully, I didn't say any of that out loud. I just kind of stood back. But all I can say is the pain is real. I did not personally experience it, but I could see it on my wife's face. 
and the pain is real, and maybe some of you experience, I mean, that, in that case, our whole plan that we had was completely upended, and, you know, at the end of it was a healthy child, and so even though our plans were disrupted, we had a story that at the end was, you know, a healthy baby, which we rejoice in. But the reality is, even as we laugh at those stories and we think of, you know, we think of light and joyful moments, too, of, uh, of motherhood, of celebrating children today and celebrating families. We know that today is one of those days where it is a reminder that as the people of God, we are always weeping and rejoicing. I mean, all the time. And so we have this moment where we're celebrating moms, but at the forefront for us is that we have moms in here who've, who've just cried out to God through the midst of infertility, and we're blessed with children, and we've rejoiced with them. And there are moms that are still here crying out for that, who are still struggling with infertility, with, 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 that, with that pain, and we, we weep with them. There are parents here who've prayed for their children who've had life-threatening illness or injury and have seen them recover and be healed, and we've rejoiced with them. And we have in here ones that have not and have lost their children. We have ones who relationships have been restored between mom and child, and we celebrate that. And there are those here today who are grieving because they have a child who's with a bro- whose relationship with them is broken. We have, for everyone who, who's celebrating their mom here and present, that we get to pray for at the end and we get to celebrate are those who have lost their moms, their moms have, have died, and this day is hard for them. It's a difficult day. And so we're always weeping and rejoicing as the people of God, all the time. And this is what Romans 8 tells us. When we think of not just the pain of, of, of loss within family, but we see around us war, and we see disease, and we see division among people. The Apostle Paul is describing it in Romans 8. He says this, For that we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan inwardly as we await eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. The whole creation is groaning together, how? Like in the pains of childbirth. So when we, when we experience pain around us, we should go, yeah, that, that's actually what it is. We have the first fruits of the Spirit. And in other words, we have, we have, we have been saved by, by God's grace. The Spirit of God is inside of us. But we long for, what does it say? The redemption of our bodies. Isn't that an incredible reminder that the resurrection will be a physical resurrection, that we will get new bodies? that we will live with God forever, that Jesus will reign over us and that he will come back and he will wipe away every tear from every eye. But now there is lament and there is sorrow and it is real. And any kind of shifting away of that or like trying to make it feel better actually causes us to live less and less in reality. And so when we hear these words, you will, you will weep. We have to have the clear understanding of the times in which we live. Jesus is reminding them, hey, when this moment happens, when I die, you're going to weep because you're not going to see me. But then he makes a contrast. He says, but the world will rejoice. Now I want you to pay close attention to that word. The world will rejoice. Jesus says, he uses this word world 27 times in this passage. In this whole, you know, that we're studying over these, these months. He is making a striking contrast between his ways and the ways of the world. And look at the word that he uses. The the world will rejoice. Not agree to disagree. The world will celebrate Jesus on the cross because they will see him as a criminal. If you were in our Bible reading plan, and encourage you to be and download the app and be a part of that, then on Thursday you would have read about this very thing that he's talking about. I want to read it to you. It's in Luke chapter 23. This is Jesus with Pontius Pilate before the people, and he's offering to free one man. It says, Pilate called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, you brought me this man, talking to Jesus, 
as one who was inciting the people to rebellion. I have examined him in your presence and have found no basis for your charges against him. Now, let's just, let's just keep in mind, Pilate, is a, is, he's, an, he's a pagan ruler. Like, he's an evil man. It's not like Pilate is like a righteous person. But what is he saying? I have no basis for your charges against him, neither has Herod, for he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. But the whole crowd shouted, away with this man. Release Barabbas to us. Barabbas had been into prison, thrown into prison for an insurrection in the city and for murder. Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again, but they kept shouting, crucify him, crucify him. For the third time he spoke to them, why? What crime has this man committed? I have found in him no grounds for the death penalty. Therefore, I will have punished him and then release him. But the loud shouts, they, they insistently demanded that he be crucified and their shouts prevailed. So Pilate decided to grant their demand. He released it. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder and the one they asked for and surrendered Jesus to their will. Do you find those words just so striking? Now, honestly, in the, in the, this isn't in the plan of God. <laughs> this is, God used all this for our good. But can we just for a moment recognize what happened to Pilate at that moment? He surrendered the people to their will. And they saw Jesus, one worthy of death, and they said, crucify him. The world will rejoice. Now, this contrast is really, really important because contrast brings clarity. Contrast allows you to see things clearly. Like if you were to see something with two colors that are just almost the exact same color, it's hard to distinguish what the letters are. It's hard to distinguish what you have. But when you have two contrasting colors, then what you see all of a sudden becomes into focus. Jesus is contrasting the world so that, so that his disciples will see very clearly what is in front of them. You will weep, but the world will rejoice because they will see Jesus as one who is deserving of the cross. Isaiah chapter 5, in his rebuke, Isaiah's rebuke to the, to the people of God, he says, Woe to, the, woe to those who call evil good and good evil who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. And as we try to just grasp the parallels for us as, as God's people today, we have this going on all around us. And in fact, this call to be light in the midst of darkness, here, here's an incredible contrast as we think of, of darkness not being able to hide the light is that if we shut all the lights in here off and it was in complete pitch darkness, just even one candle, one flickering of a flame would actually give light for us to see in here. Just one small light would penetrate the darkness because the darkness cannot hide the light. It's about contrast. Jesus is saying, the world will rejoice. Isaiah says, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes, who are clever in their own sight, who call evil good and good evil. And we see this all around us. Even when we, when we think of Mother's Day, we, have a, we live in a world where people are confused on what it takes to even have a baby. We're confused on what a man is and what a woman is. I, uh, I read something a pastor just posted this week, and I just thought, wow, that kind of sums it up as we think of some of the things that are happening in the courts right now. And he said this, he said, if you told me when I was younger that men would be declared able to give birth and that Roe v. Wade would be overturned, I simply would not have believed you. But on both sides of the culture wars, the unthinkable is happening before our eyes. And as we think of the peop at, at being the people of God, he here's, what, here's what it looks like not to be clever in our own sight is that when we are crystal clear on the truth, in other words, we are those who hold up what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman, and we pass that on to the next generation. We're, like as we hold up today, the value of motherhood, the value of family. When we are those who define, because here the situation in the courts is not about defining what's, whether abortion is right or wrong. It's just whether or not the, the courts are going to find it worthy in the Constitution or whether they're going to kick it to the legislature. And that's a, that's a valid thing. As Americans, that should be really important to us. 
What's in the Constitution is really important to us, but as the people of God, it doesn't matter what our courts rule. We have a consistent ethic, and that is that we have to know what life means, what it means for life to begin at conception as the people of God, and we're unwavering on that. And what that means for us is when we understand that clearly, when we understand the truth clearly, we are actually able to move towards the world with compassion. And we saw the picture, we saw a picture of that earlier with Tana and Heather. We see it in these families that are fostering children. They're saying, this is what it means to be pro-life. Isn't that what, I, I love that we have all of these people in our church that have, have advocated for pro-life issues, have been taking care of mothers that are in a crisis pregnancy situation, have been praying. I mean, we think of what's happening in the court. I mean, Lord, help us. We want the laws of our, our land to reflect you. Like whether they do or not, we're not going to change, but God have mercy on us. And to think people who have labored in prayer and intercession, people who have walked beside mothers and fathers in the midst of, of, a, of a crisis pregnancy. And we say, thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you, Lord, for that. Well, when we think of that, that our, our parents who are, who are engaging in foster care, they're doing that. They're saying, this is what it means to be pro-life. I actually just got to talk to one of our moms this week, and it was just, it was just providential, just in a conversation, and she was talking about their adoption. And she said, we didn't even know. We're in the middle of, adoption, of adopting this baby, and then we got to talk to the birth mom. And she said, I had I'd already paid my deposit for, for an abortion. And I saw one of my friends coming out, and I saw how devastated she was, and I knew I couldn't do it. And so we actually have lives in our church where we can look around and say, that's what it looks like to be pro-life. Like that girl right there was rescued, and now she's in a family that loves her. And so that, that contrast is so important. And I, I just, before we move to the next part, as we think of the world rejoicing, the world... The world is mocking the things of God. Is that I think just, just as a pastoral note, church, we, have to be, we, we don't need to be surprised. I said this a few weeks ago. We don't need to be surprised at the world's worldliness. Like, we just shouldn't be surprised by it. Jesus saw them and he had compassion. He saw them as sheep that are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. We don't need to be surprised by it, but here's what we cannot be. We cannot be mesmerized by it. We cannot be entertained by it. We cannot fill our time just being consumed by pictures of things that are mocking the ways of God. They are mocking what is good and true and beautiful. And if you've ever thought, is there a time where we need to really present ourselves as counterculture? It is now. And so what happens is that we, we have to, we, we are called to be sober-minded, which is really what this whole passage is about. Like when it's referring to moms, it's really referring to moms as being visionaries as being those who are able to endure something really difficult because there's something on, this, on the other side of it that they have clear vision about. And that's what it says, verse 21. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come, but when she has delivered the baby, she no longer remembers the anguish for the joy that a human being has been born into the world, so also you will have sorrow now. I mean, isn't that amazing? He's telling them, look, there's this moment that happens in life but there's sorrow that then turns into joy. And it's actually what's about to happen, what's to come, that gives endurance in the present. And so it's clear that, I mean, I think that the most clear interpretation of this passage is that he's talking about those days that after his crucifixion, some people think he was speaking more broadly, but even just, just taking it at face value, that he's preparing them for that, those moments when he's away. But there certainly is something for us as the people of God where we can, we can hold on to this truth as something for us just in the idea of Jesus saying, uh, you will see me in the future. So a little while you will not see me, but then again, a little, again in a little while you will see me. That's exactly where we find ourselves right now. So again, we're not, we're not shaken, we're not taken off guard at the world's worldliness like we expect it. When we see things around us that are difficult, we're like, oh, this is, this is all creation groaning like the pains of childbirth. That's what's happening. So we're aware of that. But then we hear Jesus say, you will see me again. Revelation 21, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. All those places where there's tear and sorrow and lament, Jesus will come and he will wipe away every tear from every eye. 
we had a new baby born in the church in the last couple of weeks. Her name is Harlow, and her parents, Brad and Kristen, as we think of Mother's Day, have one of those really challenging stories. I want to show you a picture of her first because she is beautiful. Look at that sweet girl. And her name is Harlow, and Brad and Kristen are at home. They're watching the service now, and they know that I, I asked for permission to just share a brief part of their story. And had this great moment. I was with Chris, um, who's on our staff, and um, he and his wife, Shelly, 14 years ago, had a baby with special needs that only lived for a month. And he was able to come and bring that story of pain to, uh, and, and how God sustained them through it and, and bring it there. And I just, just, just to say on behalf of the church, uh, to the church, one of the things that was so great is we were there, we were there with the hospice uh, workers because uh, Har- Harlow was born without most of her brain. And so she, you know, apart from the miraculous work of God, and, and we were praying for that, that God would sustain her life, but apart from that happening, she's not gonna live a long life at all. And so we were there with hospice, and one of the things they said is they said, oh, she's coming to church. So they were, they were talking like, just tell us know how it's done because she's gonna be around the family of God. And I thought, what an incredible picture. But they're saying, we're coming because she's gonna hear the sound of the church singing praises to our God. But they have, Brad and, you know, Brad and Kristen's story is, is one that they prayed for a long time for her. And so the pregnancy alone was a miracle. And so to have this, these conflicting feelings of this miracle birth and yet to be told in the hospital just a day after her birth that she's not going to live very long. And if you see her and hold her, she, you would not know there was a thing wrong with her. I mean, she is just absolutely beautiful. And as Kristen was talking to us, she just shared so honestly, again, God, know, God, God sees, he knows. He, he knows exactly where we are. But when, we, when we're able to actually say it out loud in a vulnerable place, there's just something so beautiful about it. So Kristen says, you know, I, I feel guilty because I, there's a part of me that feels like I want to hold back. Like, I don't want to love her fully because I know what's coming. And I just said, Kristen, like, thank you for saying that out loud because here's the thing. Every normal person, every normal human in your situation would be exactly where you are. Like, that's a, that's a normal response as a person. And yet what happens and what's already happened in their hearts is God transforms our hearts. He opens us up to love with his love. And we say, even though it's going to hurt us greatly, even, even though it's going to cost us something, we're going to love unconditionally, unreservedly. And to say, every day that we have with our children is a gift. Because ultimately, even though she has this diagnosis, the reality is, none of us know how long. None of us know how long we have. And every time we see a parent have to bury a child, we can say together, the world is not right. Right? All creation is groaning. This is not how it should be. Come, Lord Jesus. We want you to come and make all things new. But the sorrow turning to joy is this, is that as the people of God, when we have that clearly in view, we are actually able to love fully in the moment. We're able to give, to give of ourselves. We're to be, we're to be able to, to be people who push back darkness because we understand the truth clearly. So you see that understanding what is true in our minds actually allows us to see what's going on around us clearly. That's why we don't want to just fill our mind with a bunch of garbage. We, we have to be sober-minded. We, be, we have to be like mothers who know on the other side of labor there's going to be this beautiful child and who are enduring pain to see that happen. And I can't help but think, I can't help but think of, you know, what we pray God willing would happen as we see just as, as end times come, as we see a lot of the things that are described in end times, whether we, we don't know, but whether we are or not, we can definitely, we can definitely feel as the people of God that the, temp, the temperature is being turned up. Is that what accompanies great, um, just great evil around us is, uh, is, is also an outpouring of God's spirit and great revival, people coming to faith in Christ, people seeing the difference between darkness and light. And what that means for us as God's people is that it costs us something. Just like it costs Brad and Kristen to love deeply, regardless of how long Harlow lives. Just like it costs us to raise our children and say, we're going to stay engaged. Just, I mean, how beautiful what Heather said. Well, wh- how, did you, how did you enter into this space? Because I became a mom. And in that I got, I got <laughs> my heart was enlarged. And from that, God showed me his heart. And we just said, okay, God, we don't know what this is going to look like, but we're going to step into this space regardless of what it costs us. That revival, this is just a question I'm asking myself because I love my comfort. Is God, how would it disrupt me if, if masses of people came to faith in you? 
Like it would, it would be like we were disrupted when we had children. <laughs> a bunch of people in diapers and two-year-olds and people working through addiction and people just struggling because they, they don't know how to work it out in relationships and we have to just bear up with them in love. And so it takes people who say your sorrow will turn to joy. <laughs> like your difficulty in this moment because Jesus is... He is in control. Jesus is coming back and he's making all things new. And then Jesus says the most, he just says the most striking thing to them. I just love this. Verse 22. He says, so also you will have sorrow now, but you will see me again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. Like Jesus is preparing them to sustain persecution. And what does he root? What does he root themselves in? his secure love that he is exhibiting from the Father, which is all about what John 14 through 16 is about. And the interaction between Jesus and the Father is about Jesus knowing the Father, loving the Father, and then Jesus loving us with that kind of love. And he says, no one, the way he describes it is, no one will take your joy from you. You will have a joy that is secure because joy gives us endurance. Joy anchors us. And these disciples, we know that they understood this because they actually lived it out. They actually endured persecution. So John was exiled to Patmos. I mean, he's like a political prisoner. He was in, I mean, he's like a a labor camp. His brother James, Acts chapter 12 tells us, was died by the sword. So these men that Jesus were talking to, he prepared them for the very thing that they were going to encounter, which was persecution which was literally having to give their lives away for the sake of what they knew was true. And how was he going to prepare them for that? He was going to tell them, this joy, no one will take it away from you. No one will take this joy away from you. And so as we kind of, kind of wrap this up, I, I kind of have two things I want to say in two passages of Scripture. One is that when we think of this, this joy, which if you, if you haven't listened to John's message from two weeks ago, you need to go back and listen to it on joy. And on Jesus' God's face shining on us. And what it means to belong to him. What it means to have joy in the midst of persecution, in the midst of suffering. And I really believe that there's some of you, just from having interacted with some of you, talking to you about other people that are close to you, that are here, that are, that are in this space of conversation, whether you're physically here right now or you're in the conversation with us, who you've ascribed to things of God, you've You've heard different things about him. There's some, there's some element of you leaning into the things of God in some way, but you have really never surrendered your life to him. And when Jesus was engaging with a curious man named Nicodemus, he used a birth metaphor to describe transformation. He goes and asks, he asks Jesus, how is it that you are doing these things? And Jesus answered him, truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter in a second time into his mother's womb? And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the spirit, he can't enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. What it feels like to be transformed, it's dramatic, it's it's as dramatic as birth. Jesus described it as a rebirth, being born again. That which is of flesh is of flesh, but that which is born of spirit is of spirit. This is, this is a work of the spirit. This is not like I've grabbed these three truths and now I'm holding on to them. It's I've surrendered myself to the lordship of Christ and he has made me new. And it's the picture Jesus gives is like a baby being born, is being reborn. The second passage I want to read to you as we close, and Tim, you can come, is as the people of God solidifying ourselves, anchoring ourselves in the joy of knowing him, of being his, and not being surprised when things are difficult. Here again, the metaphor of birth pains. It says in, verse, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 6, it says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. So Jesus is preparing them for the end times. Things should look familiar to you. You, th- you think this is, there's, there's things that are, 
shaking around us. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. And all these things are the beginning of birth pains. So what does it feel like when creation is ruined? It's like birth pains. Then you'll be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. That wasn't just true of the disciples. It's true of people now. People are being persecuted. Even just have a moment. I mean, again, think, think of the connection. To have a moment like talking to Serge and then getting to meet his parents and then testify about over the last year having people trying to shut their church down. These are like, they're right here. They're in Canada. This is not like another, this is not like another story somewhere far off. This is not some distant thing. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted, to be put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of, wicked, of wickedness. Here, everything we see in entertainment today, the increase of wickedness, do not, be inter- do not be captivated by it. The love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. See, Jesus is preparing his people for sorrow that will end with joy. But those who have that kind of vision that mom vision of being able to endure something like persecution are those who know who writes the story, who knows the end from the beginning. And church, as the people of God, we have to be people prepared for these very times. Like prepared for difficulty, prepared for persecution, prepared for people to hate us. But again, they're not our enemies. We're actually stepping towards the world from a place of love, which is exactly it's all of what John 17, Jesus is going to say. I sent you into the world. But in the meantime, it's probably going to feel a lot like birth pains. It's going to feel like, can this be over already? But the people who endure to the end are those who have rooted themselves in the love of God who know the joy, the satisfaction of belonging to him. And so I would just, if you guys could just bow your heads and let's just take a moment and I want you to just ask the Holy Spirit, just ask God, what is it that you needed to hear? And if you guys could just bring down the lights because I want us to take a moment to pray. Thank you for being faithful to speak. That just like the disciples, when we can ask the question, I don't, and say, I don't know what's going on. And God, that you come and that you, in your kindness, you reveal yourself to us. You reveal what is true, what brings life. We want to be people who are filled with your life and who bring your life to a world that is hurting. And so we thank you for making us people of vision the way that our moms are people of vision, able to endure suffering and then see joy on the other side. Would you make us those kind of people? Would you make us a church with that kind of resolve? People of vision, people willing to weep and lament and mourn, but say we have one who is coming who is going to make all things new. We have one who is coming who is going to wipe away every tear from every eye. And so we thank you for that promise. We thank you that you've made us people of promise. We thank you for our moms today. And we just take a moment now to bless them. Um, We just want to to pray for our moms. And then we're going to have one closing song. that The band's going to lead us in the song Cornerstone. And as we do, we're going to have a prayer team up here. So I just want you to know we're going to pray for the moms specifically. But then if there's anything, if you need to make a response to God in some way, 
to surrender your life to him to the first time. If, there's, if you say, man, Mother, Mother's Day is a really hard day for me and we can just put an arm around you and pray for you, whatever it is, we wanna do that. But the first thing we wanna do is we do wanna pray for all the moms that are here. Would you, would you allow us to pray for you by standing up? That's all moms, moms, grandmothers. Would you stay, stand up? Can we just give a hand to our moms? <laughs> Love you. You know, as we pray, I'm just gonna lead us in prayer. And I do, want, I do want us to just put a hand on a mom, okay? So kids that are here, you can put a hand on your mom, but any mom, it doesn't have to be somebody related to you. And we're just gonna pray blessing over them. One of the things that um, our counseling team told us is that, you know, this whole idea of mom guilt is real. Like just feeling like you're not enough. And if there's something that will take away a sense of vision, it's, it's shame and guilt, it's condemnation. And we know exactly where that comes from. It comes from the enemy. And you look around and we have incredible moms around us, but then email will just lie to you and say, you're not enough. Oh, if you just had this together, if you had just done this right, whatever it might be, whatever way in which the enemy might lie to you, we just want you to know that even just to have children takes incredible vision. It takes perseverance. And this call from the scripture today is for us to be like you. And so we know that to be people of vision, it it involves us silencing the enemy of who is always speaking shame and condemnation and guilt. And so we want to pray the freedom of the Lord over you today. So let's pray. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we hold up today that you are the giver of life, and we thank you for that. You are the giver of life. And so all of us here that are today, we're we're here today and we have breath in our lungs because you have breathed life into us. But this life that you have given us has taken a person. And so we thank you for our moms who you used to give us life. And we pray blessing on them today. We pray honor on them today. We thank you for their sacrifice. God, we pray that when the world is confused about things, that we would would be able to hold up, we would be able to hold high these women and celebrate them and cherish them. And so we thank you, Lord, for strength. We thank you for endurance and patience with joy. So for those who who are currently carrying children, we just pray for your strength for them. For those who've just had babies or have small children who are um, just in the the middle of it, uh, just the middle of all the challenges of raising small, small children, we just thank you for your strength and your provision for them. We thank you for rest, for sleep at night. For those who are raising older children, for those who are raising adult children, for those who are dealing with the grief of children who have walked away from you, God, we pray your nearness to them right now. We pray as we continue to pray that you would call these prodigals back home, that you would arrest them, that you would awaken them to you. So we thank you for endurance for these moms to be able to labor in intercession and to do it from a place of peace and security and joy in you. We pray for moms like Kristen who are having to bear up with a a difficult diagnosis of a child, who are having to deal with something really, really challenging like that. We thank you for the the power of your spirit to be at work in them, for, for you to love through them. So for you to just shower them with your love and affection. And so we pray, Lord, for your freedom for these moms today. We pray for your freedom and life for them. We pray that they would hear the words of the Father over them, over and over and over in them. Again, they would hear the words of the Father. Just think for a moment as we close of Jesus getting the affirmation of the Father. at his baptism. And so we thank you for your words over these moms, that they are your daughters, that you are pleased with them, that your pleasure is over them, God, that your love is over them. We thank you for your blessing on them today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can stand up. The band's gonna lead us. The prayer team can come up for this last song. It's just our last 
five minutes together to just respond, to say, Jesus, we anchor ourselves in you. So let's respond together. If you want to pray with one of us, please come and pray. If you're, just really believe that there are people here just right on the verge of surrendering. And we just say, just the invitation is to respond to him today. And, um, and then I'll close the service at the end with a blessing. Let's respond to him. Oh, 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 oh,
that our lives are built on the foundation that is you. Um, we pray that as we go from this place, that we would go um, as people who are light in the midst of darkness. We pray that for those who are rejoicing today on Mother's Day, that we would rejoice with them. For those who are weeping today, that we would weep with them. And we thank you that we carry with you your love and your presence, all that you are. Um, we just find great joy in you today, and we leave in that joy. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we, as we close, I just want to remind you of two things. Um, Heather will be in the lobby if you'd like to help with the things going on at Three Rivers Respite. And uh, we need you to sign up to help with uh, Vacation Bible School so that we can bless our children. So please sign up for that. As you leave, I want to pray this blessing over you from Numbers chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Go in peace today. You're loved.